Then come unto him the Sadducees, uh, which say there is no resurrection. And they ask him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die, and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her, and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise. And the seven had her, and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses? How in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for bringing us here uh, together, safely bringing us here together this morning. Um, We thank you for your word, uh, for uh, speaking through your apostles and prophets so that we might know you, uh, know your will, know the truth of your gospel. We thank you for preserving this word for us and for uh, giving us the privilege of opening it and hearing from it this morning. We pray that your word would be preached by the power of your spirit uh, to the glory of your name and the edification of your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Religion, uh, broadly speaking, serves all kinds of purposes in the world, depending on uh, which religion you're talking about. Uh, Religion can provide people with all kinds of earthly comforts, uh, the security of a devoted community. Uh, We certainly see that with the Mormons up here. Um, Strong ties to the community just because you come into that community and you have all kinds of resources uh, at your disposal. That's a a blessing that religion can bring. Uh, Other religions, you know, just bringing the right set of laws that make the self-righteous feel like they can uh, measure up to God's standard. Uh, some religions point to the future, uh, the importance of a future existence. Christianity is not the only one to do that, whether it's you, know, you becoming a god one day or a harem of virgins awaiting you. Plenty of religions put forward these ideas of an eternal existence and blessings therein. Ultimately, there's a commonality, this is my point, a commonality between religions when it comes to trying to establish hope. Religions exist to establish some kind of hope either in the present or in the future. Some kind of peace or prosperity or freedom from evil. But we must ask, on what grounds do they seek to establish these ideas? Christianity likewise asserts that there's a hope in the world for men and women. There is a hope in the world, so we must ask as Christians, how are we grounding our assertions as to what is true? What is our hope? How do we have grounds? Do we have grounds for such a belief? Though we'll walk through this more thoroughly, I, wanna, I want these simple points to be clear from the start of our sermon this morning, of, our, of looking at this text this morning. Our grounding for what is true, our grounding for what is true is God's revelation of himself, which we have in the Holy Scriptures, in the Bible. The Bible is where we must establish all of our assertions as to what is true. And you cannot, be comfort, uh, you cannot be just comfortable with that answer on a Sunday morning, surrounded by a bunch of other people who share that assumption with you. Because when you go out into the world, uh, people are going to consider that assumption to be folly. And so you have to be okay with uh, stating that, uh, making that assertion that the Bible is our standard for truth. God's revelation of himself out in a a hostile world uh, where that type of, uh, that assertion is not just readily accepted as it is here amongst brothers and sisters. We are not the first generation to face prideful mockers who think very highly of human philosophy. But that's ultimately what we're going to see in the Sadducees, is a group of people, certainly with a veneer of religion, but who uh, think very highly of uh, their own thought processes and what they're able to come to in terms of conclusions from human philosophy. And so we must believe that God has revealed himself in his word and be ready to state that plainly with those who think that uh, they're smart for denying such a fact as fanciful or just naive on the part of Christians. How could you believe that? And so we must remember, right, these are, these are foundational uh, elements to establishing any truth for us. God is creator, we are creatures. Remember that we have no basis for knowledge apart from revelation from God to us as his creatures. God reveals and therefore we know. 
That's fundamental to our understanding of how we know anything. God reveals, and therefore we know. And so he's given us a word. We're not embarrassed by the Bible. It's our source of truth. And the Bible presents to us, as our central, as central to our hope, rather, central to our hope, the resurrection of the dead. That is central to the Christian hope is this resurrection from the dead. This belief has been a source of mockery for many through history. But our text this morning, uh, this Lord's Day, serves as a proof that even you know, our Lord Jesus tells us this is not just something that even is a New Testament hope, but has been a hope of the people of God down through the ages. He's going to point us all the way back to Abraham. And, and keep in mind, too, you know, reading through that text this morning, you heard Lance read from Exodus 3. We'll look at that again shortly. Uh, but keep that text in mind. You know, is that the text you would go to if somebody told you to prove, from, even from the Bible, let's say they're giving you the ground of the Bible, is that the text you're going to go to to prove resurrection from the dead? Are you going to Exodus 3? God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why does Jesus go there? How does that make sense? We want, uh, my goal is to help us understand that this morning. This hope, this hope that stretches back, we see, to, to Abraham, was not a vain hope, one removed from reality or possibility. Rather, this hope has been fixed. It's a, a fixed hope. It's an anchored hope. And we're going to see that it's actually anchored in the nature of God. This hope is anchored in the very nature of God himself and what it means for God to be someone's God. The Apostle Paul tells us that our faith stands or falls on the basis of this very doctrine, this doctrine of the resurrection. If we have a real hope in the resurrection, there and there is cause for literally endless rejoicing. And if we do not have this hope, then literally everything is in vain. And you're wasting your time with this Christianity thing. So it's in regards to the resurrection that Jesus is confronted in our text this morning. And this time the attack comes from the Sadducees. And we've seen in this section of Mark's gospel, basically uh, one attack after another from different groups of religious leaders in Jerusalem who are coming to Jesus asking questions, hoping in asking these questions that they're going to be able to embarrass him uh, or cause him to blaspheme. Uh, Matthew Henry describes the Sadducees as the deists of their day. All right, so don't think of these guys as uh, you know, just a, some, some nuanced disagreement on the resurrection. The, the Sadducees denied almost the entire Old Testament scriptures. They only held to the Pentateuch. So the first five books of the Bible Right, given by Moses, that's the only thing they consider to be canon, to be scripture. Uh, and so this is one of, of numerous issues that the, the Sadducees have. Now, we know the Sadducees were in uh, positions of power, right? They made up the Sanhedrin along with the Pharisees, and it was typically from uh, the group of the Sadducees that the high priest would be appointed, uh, which tells you about the religious state of, of Jerusalem in that day. If you have a fundamental doctrine, not just a New Testament doctrine, but a fundamental doctrine that the Pharisees even believed, with this resurrection, you have, you have people who are denying that who are able to get into seats of power in the Sanhedrin, able to be the high priest in Jerusalem. Right, so it's not, it's not hyperbole when Jesus goes into these synagogues or in Revelation when he's writing to the churches and he calls them synagogues of Satan. Like, oh, that's strong language from Jesus. Well, it's not, it's not hyperbole. These places have turned from the Lord. They're not serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we've got, we've got uh, divided parties within, uh, within the Sanhedrin, the religious elite in Jerusalem, those who are uh, leading uh, temple worship there. Uh, and we see even, you know, we know, uh, we see more of the doctrinal uh, discrepancies between the Pharisees and the Sadducees in, in Acts when Paul uh, comes before the high priest. I remember he uh, speaks ill of the high priest, kind of gets himself into some hot water. And how does Paul get himself out of that situation? He's before the, he's before the Sanhedrin, he's got the, he's got the Sadducees and the Pharisees there. And Paul, uh, keenly aware of the doctrinal discrepancies between these groups, uh, cites uh, his hope in the resurrection as to why he's on trial. This is just a few verses from Acts 23 at verse 6 through 8. But when Paul perceived uh, that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, this is right after he spoke ill of the high priest, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? Turns them against each other and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. But the Pharisees confess both. So what, what do we learn here in Acts 23? We learn that the Sadducees not only denied the physical resurrection of the body, 
but also the reality of the immortality of the soul, really the existence of a spiritual reality outside of the physical at all. Right? They're denying angel or spirit. They just For them it was, uh, and they're very clear on this if you look at their writings at all, uh, and you read Josephus on them, for example, uh, very clear that they uh, basically tr- treated men as beasts. Life was what it was, and there was no life hereafter. They were materialists, so they believed in what they could see, what they could touch. Of course, they come to Jesus with an immaterial line of logic, so they're fine with using immaterial things when it serves their purposes, right? They come to Jesus thinking they're going to trap him with this question. They think the resurrection is a joke, right? And so they're coming to Jesus trying to embarrass him, trying to give him this story about this woman and show that the resurrection is, is folly. And so they'll, they'll use immaterial things when it suits them. But in terms of what they're professing to believe in, they don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe these things, uh, that anything exists outside of what they can see, what they can touch. And all this is important to understand for our text this morning as these religious leaders uh, come to Jesus for his next round of questioning. And as I alluded to a second ago, it's, it's amazing to see, absolutely amazing to see in this, ex- this section of Mark's gospel account, just stepping back and looking at the way that Jesus dismantles every argument that comes before him from these different groups, one after another, right? No time to prepare, no time to think up a response in between. Jesus in Mark 11 and 12 gives us some of the best examples of street apologetics of all time. Right? He has an answer for each opponent, and his response to the Sadducees even earns the approval of one of the scribes. And we'll look at that next week. It's in verse 28, so one verse past where we're going to look at this morning. But one of the scribes, so a guy who is just standing against him with the Pharisees, now the scribe, they believe in the resurrection, so they want to see Jesus dunk on the Sadducees. It's a little bit of a attention for them because they want to see Jesus thrown down, but they also stand against the Sadducees. And so we see he actually gets the approval of a scribe with the way he responds to these Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees come from a different angle than the, the Pharisees had just come. Remember, the Pharisees came asking a question about taxation. Should we give taxes to Caesar? They were with the Herodians. And so that was a very political angle, obviously theological implications to what he's saying, but a very a very political angle, whereas the Sadducees are coming here uh, with pretty much purely theological uh, ends in mind. They shared the Pharisees' desire to condemn and embarrass Jesus, but the Sadducees come at it with what they think is a, an argument proving the absurdity of the resurrection of the dead. Mark adds the detail for us in verse 18 that these folks, these Sadducees, do not believe in the resurrection, so it tells us this is already known Right, Mark knows this, and it's it's something. It's an assumption, a presupposition that the Sadducees are coming into the conversation with. Right, so you don't want to don't come into this thinking, oh, the Sadducees are asking a genuine question because they really don't understand this, and they would just love for Jesus to teach them. No, they want to embarrass Jesus. They don't believe in the resurrection. They're already settled in that, and they're seeking to show show Jesus's doctrine to be faulty. The question asked by the Sadducees in verses 19 through 23 is in reference to a portion of Scripture that they were willing to quote. There's not much of it, but they've got the Pentateuch. So they go back to Moses, and they're quoting a law from Deuteronomy, verses 5 and 6, which I'll read now. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, the first, the first man who died, that his name be not put out of Israel. So this was a legitimate law that the Sadducees are appealing to uh, from Deuteronomy. Uh, and before continuing in the text, I think uh, it's an important implication just being stated in our text as if it's normative and it's no longer normative in our society and so I think it's worth mentioning. What's the assumption being made in this in this text? What's Moses assuming about uh, and what the question of the Sadducees, what is being assumed uh, as one of the primary purposes of marriage? Bearing children. It's so important that God set up a specific law to deal with a situation when a woman is left without her husband and without children. Right, That was a uh, something unfit in God's eyes and so he, uh, if the situation provided right, if there were brothers, uh, she was to marry another and and have uh, children with that brother. Pursuing the gift of children has never been in God's eyes an optional part of marriage. If God chooses to close a woman's womb, then our duty is to praise God in the midst of that trial. But it's a trial. If God never gives a child to a married couple, we are to mourn with them and encourage them to trust God in that suffering. But it's suffering. What happens in our day far too often in Christian marriages is that people pursue, pursue the curse of bitterness. 
They pursue the curse of barrenness over and against the blessing of children. And there's a story, there's literally a story in the Bible where God actually once killed a man for refusing to give seed. Right, for refusing to even allow the possibility of children to come from a marital union. It's in Genesis 38, verse 9, if you'd like to read that later. But because we do not fear God and do not believe his promises, we have a society full of Christians who despise the blessing of children and would prefer to choose the purposes of marriage from uh, a buffet of all the blessings of marriage. Because right? there's plenty of purposes to marriage. It's not just procreation. And people, would, people think they have the right to take this ordinance God has given us, right? This, this thing God has made and choose what they, they like the, the pleasure of it. They love the companionship. They love the double income. Come on. But diffi- the difficulties of children and therefore the real go- glory of marriage, they push off as if they have the right to pick and choose. Marriage that, marriages that delight in childlessness. Not marriages that are childless, right? That could come up for a number of reasons. God's sovereign over those things. But marriages that delight in childlessness do not please God. And as a side note, you know, this is a way we don't like to talk sometimes because uh, we don't allow the Bible sometimes to shape the way we need to talk. Uh, but you read through the Apostle Paul and he has no problem praising a church when they're doing something well. No problem at all. He's totally comfortable doing that. You know, I think about you know, seeking the blessing of children in this flock and I'm grateful, I'm proud. Let us continue to proclaim with the psalmist that children are an heritage of the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. And may we not, by God's grace, squander these blessings, but train our children up to love and to fear Jehovah. Again, I bring this up because I believe we live in a day in which things that were once assumptions need to be brought to the forefront uh, of our minds, uh, to the people of God. Uh, so that we might return to just the simple duties that God has assigned to us. But the Sadducees bring uh, Jesus a hypothetical case. Some people make the argument it's real, doesn't really make a difference in the case. Uh, But they bring this case to Jesus in which a woman is barren and winds up having seven men, all brothers, as husbands. And as each dies and she takes the next, uh, she's still left barren. But this was in line with the law of Moses. And so uh, where does this leave uh, this woman in the resurrection? is what the Sadducees are asking. These materialist Sadducees think that they have proven the absurdity of the resurrection by showing that this hypothetical woman would either have seven husbands in heaven, which is weird, not the design of marriage, or she would have to you know, arbitrarily choose between one of these seven. Either way, she's in a weird spot, and so the resurrection uh, is absurd. Again, we have another enemy of Christ seeking to lay a snare, and of course they think it's well thought out and not easy to overcome. But Jesus' response, we see, is masterful. Now, some of you have surely, you know, if you've, uh, if you've had moments in evangelism, if you've taken time to pursue those kind of things, you've likely had moments where God has been gracious by his spirit to maybe bring a verse to mind that you hadn't prepared beforehand, an argument you hadn't thought of, a direction you didn't anticipate taking the conversation, and God just blesses it in a particular way uh, where, uh, you know, just good fruit comes from this conversation. If you've ever had that happen, it's just a glorious moment. Uh, to experience those things, for God to bless you uh, in those moments when you're seeking to share your faith uh, or you know, argue something from the scriptures. But rarely, if ever, have you likely been able to give a four-sentence chiasm on the spot like Jesus does here. You're just not that good. You're not that smooth. Jesus bookends this rebuke. Right? The question is asked, and he bookends this rebuke to the Sadducees with two versions of virtually the same phrase. He begins and ends with, ye therefore do greatly err. Moving inward, this error of the, uh, of the Sadducees is missing a handful of realities. They're not accounting for certain things. That's what Jesus tells them. It includes the knowledge of the scriptures, an understanding of the power of God, and an understanding of uh, who God is God for. He's God for the living, not for the dead. Right? God is God of the living. So they're missing these realities, that God is the God of the living, not the dead, that they uh, do not know the scriptures and that they do not know the power of God. And then at the center of this rebuke, Jesus first gives, or he gives two things. He first gives a teaching that shows the folly of their question about marriage, followed by a teaching on the resurrection. Again, from a text that I don't think any of us, apart from Jesus going here and teaching us to go here, I don't think any of us are going to this text to prove the resurrection. But this is where Jesus goes. Again, Jesus' apologetic abilities are unmatched. We ought to learn from him here. 
Drilling further into this rebuke, we again see Jesus doing what he has done in his previous theological debates with the Pharisees, and that is appealing to the scriptures. Right? He says they're greatly erring. Right? They're, they're faulty in their understanding of what is true because they don't know the Bible. That's the first problem Jesus cites. If we would avoid error, Jesus tells us we would stick close to the text. That's what we would do. We would know the Bible front to back, and we would stick close to it. Constantly seeking to grow in that knowledge. But if you do not know the scriptures, the, the flip side of it is that you will err. Right? You'll go astray. Only if you know the scriptures will you be able to avoid the latest unbiblical trend in the world, whether it's you know being cited as a new revelation or a return to the old paths. You can say either one of those things, but if it's not in accordance with the scriptures, then it's, it's not right. Only a sound knowledge of the scriptures gives us a sure way to be kept from error. And it's worth noting here that a sound understanding of the scriptures, and this is important in our day, will always be in line with the rule of faith. It'll always be in line with the doctrine that's been passed down to us from the apostles down through the faithful church, right? The testimony of the faithful church down through church history, right? And that's, that's opposed to the idea that we can say, well, it's just me and my Bible. This is all I need. I just need to know the Bible. And I, and I have no reverence for what the Bible tells me uh, actually is uh, are other authorities that are legitimate, right? So the fact that the Bible is our ultimate and our infallible authority doesn't mean there's not other authorities that exist. The church is a legitimate authority, always in subjection to the word. But the church is a legitimate authority. The Bible itself tells us that the church is the the pillar and ground of the truth. Right? It's testified to the truth down through the ages. That's why we recite creeds together as a church. Right? Because these creeds, which were given, and we believe that the Holy Spirit is not working in our church for the first time ever. Holy Spirit's actually been working through uh, generations of faithful Christians. There's actually we're actually building on a pretty solid foundation, a pretty solid building at this point. And so we want to recognize those things and, and even submit ourselves to those things insofar as they're in line with the Word of God. Right? We have a confession of faith for that reason. We cite creeds together uh, for that reason. And so the Bible is ultimate. The Bible is infallible. It's our only infallible. It's our ultimate source, but it's not our only authority. Uh, but it is uh, what we must know. And, uh, and that's why church history is extremely important, uh, something worth studying, worth knowing, so that we might know uh, what the faithful uh, believers have, have said down through the ages. So the Sadducees claim to believe the books of Moses, right? They believe these first five books of the Bible. But we'll see that they do not even believe the portions of Scripture that they choose to accept. They err because they do not know the Scriptures. That's Jesus' first uh, rebuke to them. Next, Jesus cites their lack of knowledge in regard to God's power. The power of God. They do not know the power of God. If someone mocks you for believing in the resurrection of the dead, you ought to tell them that it is God's power that they are mocking. We as Christians do not believe that we have the ability to raise ourselves from the dead. That's not the Christian doctrine of the resurrection. We believe in the power of God to be able to do what he wills. And we believe that God does this work of resurrection as a work of grace in in the hearts of his elect people. Such a doctrine will appear fanciful to those who are steeped in materialism and human philosophies. And so, of course, the the Sadducees think they are coming with superior wisdom into this conversation, utilizing, again, immaterial logic to bring this question to Christ. But this doctrine is far from fanciful. The hope of Christians in the resurrection, which we'll talk about more shortly, rests in the revelation of God in his word to us. In that word, we are told explicitly as we saw a few weeks ago, what is impossible with man, right? Camel through the eye of a needle. is possible with God. With God, all things are possible. Therefore, our inability to resurrect ourselves is not a limiting factor in the reality of the resurrection. And so the Sadducees ask their question, and Jesus tells them from a place of profound, uh, that they're asking it from a place of profound ignorance. They don't understand the scriptures. They don't understand the power of God. They bring up Moses, Jesus will tell them, but they don't even have a clue what Moses is talking about. In verse 25, Jesus does not skip a beat in affirming the resurrection of the dead. Of course, we have seen Jesus doing this for quite a few chapters, right? When he's uh, talking with his disciples and talking to them about the nature of the kingdom of God, they still understand the kingdom of God similar to how the Herodians and the Pharisees do, which is this kingdom in which Jesus is going to bring, you know, top-down power, right? Assert himself as king, 
and there's going to be this, uh, this kind of political upheaval, this political establishment of his kingdom. And Jesus is very clear. No, I came not to be served, but to serve, to give my life as a ransom for many. Right? He's told them explicitly on multiple occasions now, I have come to die. Right? Sit on my right hand and on my left. You have no idea what you're asking. I've come to die. The next people on my right and my left are going to be on crosses. I've come to die, to give my life, and I will ra- then be raised from the dead three days later. So Jesus has been making this explicit. It's not like he's teaching on the resurrection for the first time, but each of these references has been to Jesus' own death and resurrection. Usually, again, in the context of teaching his disciples exclusively. In answering the Sadducees' question, Jesus says that there will not be marrying nor anyone being given in marriage uh, in heaven. Right? And why, why is this phrase repeated twice? Well, men marry, women are given in marriage. Man and woman's been a thing for a long time. There's a distinction there. I'll let you fill in the gaps. But Jesus' points, uh, Jesus' point is that uh, these marital unions that many of us have on this earth are not part of our existence in the resurrection. And understanding this comparison Jesus makes to angels, where right? he says we'll be like angels, I think Luke's gospel account gives us helpful insight. So this is Luke 20, verses 34 through 36. What does it mean to be compared with the angels? Jesus answering said unto them, the child, uh, the children rather of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die any more, for they are equal to unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Again, procreation is one of the great purposes of marriage. Marriage is the God-ordained means by which uh, by which procreation is to take place in the world, and that procreation does not appear to be a part of the resurrection life. Because the fact, uh, at least part of it, you know, we no longer need procreation. Uh, That's what Calvin cites. We no longer need procreation to perpetuate uh, a people on the earth because we'll live on forever. We'll be like the angels in that we will no longer die, but enjoy immortality alongside them, and we'll be like them and likewise not participating in marriage as they do not now. Now moving to verse 26, Jesus makes his positive argument here for the resurrection of the dead. Again, interestingly quoting from Exodus chapter 3. And I think this quotation is interesting on a number of levels. First, notice that Jesus, uh, go, I think in, at least in one, in one way, maybe not goes out of his way, but chooses uh, to appeal to a text that both he and the Sadducees would claim to be scripture. Because right? Jesus doesn't have an issue with the prophets of the Old Testament. So, you know, Daniel 12, 2, for example, is a very clear resurrection text. Jesus doesn't have a problem with the authority of Daniel. He doesn't have a problem with the clarity of Daniel. So he easily could have cited that and just told the the Sadducees to get over it. You're wrong for rejecting the the rest of the Old Testament. That would be fine in terms of what's true. But Jesus purposely goes to a text that the Sadducees, at least in word, we know they don't understand even what Moses said, they don't understand the scriptures, but he goes to a text that they would uh, be willing to hear. And that's what we're doing. It's a, it's a very similar situation we have with the Mormons, for example. Right? The Mormons affirm the, the Old and New Testament as Bible to a degree. Right? They're going to always want to turn to the Book of Mormon. And if you go to those texts, they might start dancing around. Oh, I, you know, that's been translated weird, this or that. I don't know if that's been faithfully preserved. But the fact that we have a text we can appeal to with them, that they at least say is Scripture, is a blessing. And so we go there, and then the Word of God cuts. Right? We believe that the Word of God is sharp. And is going to cut. And so we, we go to those texts, right? We take the Jehovah's Witnesses to Hebrews 1 and then into the Psalms, right? Because we believe the word of God cuts. So if they're going to give us that ground on any level, we're going to take it. Jesus is going to take that ground. If you want to cite to me the Pentateuch, I can go to the Pentateuch and prove the resurrection, no problem. And so that's what he does. So what exactly is the argument that Jesus is making from this text? Now, some commentators, especially more modern commentators, have uh, blasphemy, blasphemously, in my opinion, said that Jesus was here making an argument that wouldn't really hold up today. It doesn't really make a lot of sense if you go to that text. How are you pulling out uh, the resurrection of the dead? He's uh, making this argument that was good enough in his day. This is how the rabbis would do exegesis in his day, the Jewish rabbis. And so it was accepted, but it wouldn't be so easily accepted in our day. Uh, we've come so far um, you know, we could destroy Jesus in an argument. That's a good position to take up. But as Christians, uh, here is where we start always. Jesus makes perfect arguments. It's our job to understand. If somebody comes to a text like this and they say, oh yeah, you know, uh, it was good enough to thwart them, but it's not actually like logically sound, this or that. All that person's proven to you is that they should shut their mouth when it comes to teaching the Bible. They have no business talking about the Bible if they're going to talk about Jesus that way. 
right? Our job is to understand the argument, right? Unpack it, figure out how to how it works together. But we know that Jesus is making a sound argument here. That's certainly where we start. This is not only a sound argument against the Sadducees, it's an authoritative argument. Jesus is teaching us. When we read now Exodus 3, in light of this text, you need to understand what Jesus says and allow what Jesus has said to uh, affect the way you're going to interpret that text. Jesus is giving us an authoritative interpretation of this text from Exodus 3. And we must understand that before we look at his argument. Now I take Jesus' point here to be a profound but very simple one. Profound, but very simple. Here's the quote again from Exodus 3, verse 6. This is God speaking to Moses in the burning bush. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. God does not say that he was the God of Abraham, but that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this, I believe, has multiple implications. First, For God to be Abraham's God in the present means that Abraham, as well as Isaac and Jacob, have some kind of existence in the present when this is being spoken. This in and of itself proves the Sadducees wrong on one level. It proves them wrong on on one level, and that's why I brought up Acts 23 earlier, right? I don't think that in and of itself necessarily proves the resurrection of the dead, but it proves an existence, uh, a spiritual existence beyond their physical death. And so already, he's already got the, the Sadducees beat. We need to see that. But the point can be taken further, again, by understanding what it means for God to be anyone's God. If God is your God, what does that mean? What does it mean to have God as your God, specifically the God who has determined, right? To, for God to be your God means he's determined to keep gracious covenant with you. What are the implications of that? Well, think about it in the context in which God gave this word to Moses, Or just a a few verses from what Lance read this morning. This is verses 7 and 8 as well as verses 14 and 15. So he's he's bringing this word to Moses. God is, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land. So he's revealing himself to Moses for what purpose? To bring these people out of the land, unto a land, uh, unto a good land and large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. That is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So to have God as your God is to have a deliverer, a sure deliverer from every enemy. That's what it means to have God as your God. It's to have God as your strength and your shield. To have him to fight for you, to protect you, ultimately to redeem you. God is the God of life. Right? That's fundamental to who God is. Right? No life exists apart from God giving life, speaking life, upholding life by the word of his power. He has all life in himself. He is the fountain of all life. Therefore, if God is your God, fundamentally you have life. It's impossible to separate those things. There's no way to have God as your God and to be dead. He is not the God of the dead, Jesus tells us, but of the living. And this life uh, is certainly more than just a perpetual existence of our souls divorced from our bodies. right? And we can understand that even just from this nature of God uh, redeeming all things and being a God of life. right? Death is the last enemy that will be defeated, the Bible tells us. 1 Corinthians 15. And death will not have the day, death will not have the victory over our physical death any more than over the spiritual death of God's people. God's people will be delivered from both, and that deliverance from physical death will be experienced not in being spared death uh, in this life, most likely, uh, but in the resurrection of the body. And our bodies, we must understand, right, we're not Gnostics, right? Material is not, we don't want to swing the pendulum from the Sadducees, right? They saw every, everything is material, that's all that is, right? And then the Gnostics would say, you know, everything physical is bad. But that's not what we believe about our bodies. God created our bodies. He declares them good. And he's going to redeem not just uh, our souls, but our bodies. God will not leave our bodies to the destruction of the devil. 
Our bodies will not be the one thing that goes unredeemed by Jesus and his making all things new. God will surely raise up our mortal bodies, transforming them into bodies fit for our glorious resurrection. God is the God of his people, and the God with life in himself is their great deliverer. He will deliver all his people from all their enemies. So it means for God to be your God, including the physical death we experience under the curse of sin. God cannot give anything less. God cannot give anything less than eternal resurrection life to those who are his. This is summed up well in Habakkuk 1 verse 12. When people say, art, not, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one, we shall not die. Right? That's the assumption. If God is your God, then you will not die. If God is our God, that is the implication. We will not die. This response by Christ is, of course, a thorough rebuke to the Sadducees and a rebuke by way of a theological argument, but it is not simply a polemic against the Sadducees that Jesus gives us here. Our Lord's point is pastoral. If God is your God, you have life in him, even resurrection life. This is at the heart of the Christian faith, for it is at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is a make or break doctrine for the Christian. So what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Why is, such a, why is this such a central doctrine for us? Why, should we, uh, why, rather, would we still be in our sins if Christ had not raised from the dead? All men born of Adam, born under him, are born dead in trespasses and sins, in need of resurrection life, right? Paul says in Ephesians 2, born dead in trespasses and sins, born as enemies of God, in need of life in place of our deadness, forgiveness for our transgressions against God's law, right? From the fall of Adam, men have been in need of resurrection, both spiritual and physical. All sinners are in need of one who would keep the law perfectly in their place, and suffer the due penalty for their sins, right? So that God, again, might be their God, reconciling himself to them through a substitute, one who would purchase for them resurrection life. And it was this work that the son, uh, for which the Son came, taking on flesh and blood so that he would be obedient where we have failed, and die on the cross as a substitute for his people, those whom the Father had given him. Paul speaks of the spiritual aspect of this resurrection in Ephesians 2, right after mentioning that we were born dead in trespasses and sins, looking to the mercy of God. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved and hath, what? Raised us up. That's spiritual resurrection. Raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The first resurrection, as the Apostle John talks about in Revelation, the first resurrection is our being spiritually raised from the dead, being given life in Christ by his Spirit. The Bible points us to the resurrection of Christ as the confirmation of the sufficiency of his work in our place. How do we know? How do we know that Christ's work in our place was sufficient to pay for all of our sins? Remember, he's talking about uh, the righteousness that Abraham received by faith. He concludes Romans 4, verses 24 and 25 by saying, But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, this righteousness which we have by faith, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up for our offenses, went to the cross for our sins, and was raised again, resurrected for our justification. We have been legally declared righteous, right? That's justification. Legally declared righteous before God, before the throne of the Almighty, the just judge, who sees all we have done if we believe in Christ. The Christ who was delivered up for our offenses and again, resurrected for our justification. How do we know we've been made right with God? What's the, what's the seal of that? Well, Jesus is not dead in a tomb. He's raised from the dead. His sacrifice in our place has been accepted by the Father. 
He has been vindicated. He's been risen from the dead. We have been forgiven. A resurrected Christ means you can be justified through faith in him. This resurrection is the great testimony in history to the power of God. The greatest testimony in history to the power of God. Life from the dead. And that power is wielded for your good if you're trusting in him. Again, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Right, Paul's praying for these, uh, these saints in Ephesus. He wants them to understand what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. How has he displayed that power? Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Right, we just read in Ephesians 2, what, is, what does that mean for us? That Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. We're united to him, and so we have been raised from the dead as Christ was raised and are seated in heavenly places in him. Now, the way to this glorious life is first death. The way for us to have this glorious life is first death. It must be a death, though, in the one who died and rose again. That's how Paul says it in Romans 6 at verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves. What's the application for us? That Christ has been risen from the dead. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. To be dead with Christ is to count your sins, your former manner of life, right? Temptations that maybe used to plague you, and even the sins you may be choosing to walk in as a Christian. Count them all as nothing. Count it as death. Lay those sins upon Christ so that they might be dealt with and destroyed and have nothing more to do with them. You are dead in him. You live now, therefore, in him, in the power of his resurrection. To be dead with Christ is to recognize that apart from him, you have absolutely nothing. No forgiveness, no hope. In him, you have his very resurrection life. You participate in that. Paul again articulates our hope in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So this is the Christian hope. It's not fanciful, though the materialists and the modern day philosophers may scoff. They scoff without a foundation. Jesus' tomb is empty. We rest on God's revelation to us, and God in his revelation has not simply declared the glory of what it would mean for him to be our God. Though it's far out of reach for us. No, God has declared and accomplished far more. He has declared to us, he has declared us rather, his people. God has made that declaration over us. Right? We were dead in sins. What are we going to contribute to that? God has declared that over us. You are my people. I am your God. He has declared himself to be our God, and he's done this by uniting us to his incarnate son. Returning to 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, closing here, uh, this is how Paul concludes that section we looked at earlier. Right? If we don't have the resurrection of the dead, we are uh, of all people most to be pitied, most miserable. He says at verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that are slept, that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ set his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Again, it's 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 26. Now you are not only united to somebody who was resurrected from the dead, but to the resurrection and the life himself. Because Jesus lives, you can have forgiveness for your sins. Because Jesus is raised from the dead, you are no longer bound by either the condemnation or the power of sin. Sin no longer has the power to condemn you. right? Christ has paid that penalty and it no longer has the ability to enslave you. Christ has freed you. Both have been destroyed in Christ and that is, this is why 
we have not only a future resurrection hope, but a present participation. And if we're going to live lives as faithful Christians, we have to understand this. We have a present participation in the resurrection life of Christ. We have been raised spiritually from the dead. In this life, we live by, the, by faith in the Son of God. Sin has no ability to condemn us before God and no ability to hold us in its enslaving clutches. You are free in Christ to call God's law a law of liberty and to walk in that law joyfully. The application for us this morning is that we must see to it that we are living now as those who have been raised with Christ. And that we are living with an eye fixed on the glorious resurrection to come. As we keep an eye there, we will be constantly reminded of the victory that Christ will have in our lives, in our families, and in our world as we rule from heaven with him. We will be reminded that this life is not ultimate and that there is an eternal life of unimaginable glory that is yet to be revealed. Our application is simply to glory in our risen Lord and to trust in him. Because Jesus lives, you can have God as your God. As God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is yours if you are in Christ. And what does that mean to have God as your God? He's not the God of the dead, and so it means having life. It means victory over every foe, even death itself. It means eternal resurrection life in him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the glorious resurrection that... Uh, we as your people have even already experienced as we have been raised from spiritual death to spiritual life in Christ. We thank you that Jesus is risen from the dead. That the scoffers and the mockers must look upon an empty tomb. For you are seated at uh, the right hand of the Father. We thank you that we have this uh, glorious hope and we pray, Lord, that it would be uh, a driving force for us in our lives. Uh, that we would live in light of the resurrection of Christ, dead to sin, that has so long uh, entangled us, uh, enslaved us, brought words of condemnation to us. And we pray that you would help us to live in light of um, Christ's glorious work in our place, calling your law now a delight uh, as we seek to walk after you uh, in the good works that you've prepared beforehand for us to walk in. We love you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.